There's no such thing as a former KGB man, writes Mark Hollingsworth. Is the FSB, an intelligence agency, gone out of control, accountable to no one but itself and intent on subverting Western political institutions? The scale of Russian disinformation warfare and active measures is huge, even when compared to the activities at the height of the Cold War. In 1985, 1,300 KGB officers were stationed in the USA. The FBI only had 350 counterintelligence officers for comparison. And since the early days of the Cold War, the KGB seduced parliamentarians and diplomats, infiltrated the highest echelons of the civil service, and planted fake news in papers across the world. More disturbingly, it never stopped. Welcome to Silicon Curtain. All our content is also available on popular podcast platforms like Spotify and Apple Podcasts. Please like and subscribe to help new people find our fantastic speakers. And of course, if you enjoy this content, do consider supporting us by becoming a patron. Mark Hollingsworth is an investigative journalist and author of 10 books, notably London Grad from Russia with Cash, The Inside Story of the Oligarchs, and his latest book, Agents of Influence, How the KGB Subverted Western Democracies. He has also written uh, biographies of Mark Thatcher and Tim Bell and acclaimed studies on MI5 and the Saudi royal family. He started his career working for Granada TV's award-winning World in Action programme and now contributes regularly to The Times, The Mail on Sunday, The Guardian, The Sunday Times and other publications. Mark, I am uh, privileged to welcome you back to the channel for the second time. And this time we're going to talk about the KGB. And of course, the KGB was a formative organization in the early life of Putin and, of course, fueled many of his ambitions when he was young. Uh, yes, indeed. I mean, I think uh, to understand what Putin is doing in Ukraine, you have to uh, examine and understand what, uh, Putin's formative years, uh, which were in, in the KGB in the 1980s. And, you know, he was stationed in St. Petersburg in the early 80s, and then he was moved to Dresden in East Germany. And he was physically present when the uh, Soviet Union collapsed and the wall, the wall came down uh, between East and West Germany. And uh, it made a, a lasting impression on him. You know, he was physically there when the phone calls from, from Moscow came through. And he, uh, according to all the, the accounts, uh, Putin said, well, where is the, where, where, when are you going to send in the help? When are you going to send in the cavalry, basically? And the word from Moscow is, is there's no more help, in it. I'm paraphrasing. And so that left a lasting impression on him. And, and my view is that really ever since, and certainly since 2014, He's been um, anxious to try and revive the Soviet Union uh, politically and strategically. And um, uh, that's what we're seeing in Ukraine. He's basically revived the Cold War, Cold War and he wants to restore the so uh, Russia to its, its former self. And of course, the sort of paranoia, the aggressive active measures that will break down in a minute, they are not just a big geopolitical game. They are also a very effective tool to suppress internal dissent as well. So the KGB significantly, you know, one of its main jobs was to actually crush uh, internal dissenters, to crush uh, sort of Samizdat and anyone, you know, wanting to uh, counter the regime. And of course, that, I believe, is where Putin spent a lot of his time in the KGB, sort of just uh, tracking and infiltrating and probably threatening um, uh, sort of dissidents or, or you know, young young people who were becoming politically uh, active. Yes, when Putin was um, in the KGB in the early 80s, he was based in St. Petersburg, and that was the beginnings of um, dissidents and liberals and um, people who believed in democracy who were then starting to be a bit more um, brave in terms of uh, uh, opposing the Soviet Union and communism. And he was, as a member of the KGB, part of his job was to put these people under surveillance, harass them, undermine them, and use all the oppressive tricks and um, operational uh, methods um, of the KGB to, to do that and to smear them, 
Um, for example, they used um, a man called Victor Louis, who was a uh, on the on the surface a foreign correspondent, Russian, based in Moscow, and he was used to uh, write articles. Um, for example, uh, smearing uh, the daughter of Stalin, who who had, had, had decided to become more uh, critical um, of Stalin, and and so he so they they deployed any. Um, what they call active measure, which is a, just a, another form of words for disinformation against distance within the Soviet Union at that time. And we're going to break down some of these techniques. So active measures is a really important concept, isn't it? But also things like disinformation, which is distinct from propaganda. And I'd love to hear your sort of definitions of those two. But we also have things like compromat uh, and, and, and other tools in the sort of... Uh, not just the KGB, is it? Because, of course, you have different divisions. You have GRU as well. Let's break down the divisions first uh, so we're clear on which organization we're talking about within the secret uh, services, and then maybe break down some of the key tools um, in the uh, you know the Russian secret state's toolbox to coerce influence and sometimes even overthrow governments. Well... There's a term, excuse me, there's a term called active measures, um, which the KGB used really th for the last hundred years. You have to remember that after the 1917 Russian Revolution, uh, the Russian Secret Service was called the Cheka, and then it would change its name, then became the NKVD, and the KGB itself was only formally um, constituted in 1954, the height of the Cold War. But um, certainly during the Cold War, and to some extent before, but primarily during the Cold War, its role was um, to implement what they call active measures, which was basically means active operations to undermine, destabilize, disrupt, uh, damage uh, NATO and the West and any Western democracies. And so within that framework of active measures, you had a whole series of of operations and dirty tricks, primarily disinformation, a lot of forgery of documents, uh, recruiting uh, political agents within NATO and the West, uh, compromat, which is the Russian word for basically compromising information, which was done by largely um, honey trapping of both heterosexual and gay people to obtain compromising information. And then also uh, secretly funding front groups, secretly funding, uh, even the try to um, fund American presidential candidates. And so there's a whole range of measures, which they call active measures. So it wasn't just, the KGB was not just about gathering intelligence. It wasn't just going into the US and, and, and NATO countries in the UK and trying to find out what was going on, trying to find out from the inside, it was an active operation against those countries as opposed to what the majority of, of security services do, or what they should do, is basically gather intelligence and find out what's really happening in the countries where they're based. And does this sort of interventionist style uh, of, the, uh, of the Russian operations where does that date to? Do we have to go back to the 1930s or do we go back further to the revolution itself? Or can you already see traces of this in the Tsarist secret police who were in some ways, uh, you know, it's it, it's believed that, you know, their agents and assets uh, were actually involved in, say, the 1905 revolution. Um, I mean, is this sort of this this uh, meddling in the actual processes uh, of society and politics? Um, has that always been a, a hallmark of the Russian secret state? Well, I think you can trace uh, the importance and the priority of the Russian secret police way back to Ivan the, the Terrible, Peter the Great, or and the Tsars. Um, and they were used, they used the secret police in Russia mainly to suppress any dissent because obviously it was an autocracy. The Tsars were believed in the divine right uh, to rule. Um, and Peter the Great and Ivan the Terrible particularly used secret police uh, effective mainly to put uh, their own citizens under surveillance, make sure there was no uh, reform, that there was no political opposition, that anyone who criticized or opposed them could be suppressed and. Uh, imprisoned or executed. So it was very much internally within Russia. And that 
really carried on through the 19th century um, with the czars, um, uh, who were just as autocratic as Putin is today. And it's no surprise that Putin's favorite czar, his favorite ruler, was not actually not Peter the Great or Ivan the Terrible, but was Tsar uh, um, Alexander the Third um, who in the 19th century. And so this tradition carried on. The, the role of the KGB in terms of active measures against the West really only changed after the um, 1970 revolution, when um, Lenin uh, believed that the only way that the Soviet Union could survive was to try and undermine its enemies in the West. So he implemented active measures, and although the Cheka at that time uh, was obviously a very oppressive uh, organ agency that, that did hor horrific things to its own people, and you had the show trials. There was the, the origins of um, active measures, uh, particularly disinformation. And I found a quote by Lenin um, when he said in, in 1921, he wrote a memo to one of his commissars. He said, to tell the truth is a largely bourgeois concept, and we have to use all the um, measures at our disposal to... Um, uh, promote the revolution, but also undermine uh, its enemies in the West. So that was a real sea change, really from the 1920s onwards, um, that the Russian intelligence agencies were not just um, an agency of repression within its own country, but looked out um, into the West to try and uh, damage and destabilize uh, Western countries. And to an extent, uh, you could almost say that that they had a mission, um, and that mission was to propagate, uh, you know, the sort of Bolshevik conception of how society should be run. So there was an ideological underpinning to some of this activity. So even if, you know, it's it's not that apparent, and even if it's in, you know imbued with all sorts of lies and subterfuge, the Soviet Union was proselytizing a a, a certain um, way of living now putin's regime does not seem to have a philosophy uh that's akin to that and yet we still see the same paranoid hostility and aggression i mean what's your impression there is there any kind of tangible ideas behind it or is it simply power and coercion for its own sake I think um, during the you're quite right. During the Cold War, um, the KGB acted. Um, uh, you know, mission was ideological in the sense that their mission was to destroy capitalism, promote socialism and communism, and to try and uh, destabilize and weaken. And in in effect, in, in the in the long term, they thought they might even abolish uh, capitalist societies in the West by these measures, by these active measures, and so. They, that was their motivation, and I think many KGB officers believed in that. They believed that communism was the true uh, ideology, the best way for society to be structured. And the KGB reported to the Communist Party as well. This is the big difference from today, is that they're, they're the only form of accountability. I mean, there was in reality, they didn't have any real accountability. They were allowed to do anything, assassinate, smear, honey trap. Uh, forged documents, but th there was a certain amount of bureaucratic accountability, and they did only report to the Communist Party in Moscow, not to the Kremlin or the Politburo. The ultimately they did, but that was the that was the chain of command, the form of accountability under Putin. Um, obviously, the Communist Party doesn't exist. There's don't there's not that same ideological um, motive, although the, I think he does have a kind of ideology in the sense that of, I suppose, what you would call authoritarian nationalism. You know, he, even Putin accepts that the economic model for communism didn't work and could not could not be sustained, hence the end of the Cold War. But Putin has a certain, uh, what you would call it, I would call it authoritarian nationalism combined with um, an adherence to the Orthodox Church. It's a sort of strange combination. Um, but uh, so the current Russian intelligence agents in the FSB, they report, but they don't report to any political party. They report really to the Kremlin and Putin, and they're, they're used really much as a sort of agency of enforcement, like a private army for Putin. They're not, they don't have that same ideology. I don't think 
hardly any FSB officers have any political consciousness or political principles. For them, it's just, you know, a, a crude nationalism and that, you know, we want to make Russia great again and and destroy our enemies and we'll use any methods to do that. And you raise the question there of orthodoxy. That in itself is is difficult to unpick, isn't it? In that do people uh in in the Slovakia, and it's 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 quite clear that you know orthodoxy is an incredibly powerful tool for them. I think there is a sort of KGB chapel on Lubyanka Square where at one point it was hoped there was going to be a, a memorial to the victims of, of of Stalin's repressions, and that never happened. Um but I guess this is an impossible question, but it's widely understood that the hierarchy of the Orthodox Church through the communist period, and really no no different now, the hierarchy are or were KGB agents. They're answerable to the state. They have no independent agency or power. Um, if they were ever to go against, you know, what, what the Kremlin wants, um, they wouldn't last five minutes, but that, that's not even a question because they're part of the same organism, the same beast. Um, so can we can we even understand whether the Siloviki, so called of the KGB, whether they actually believe in orthodoxy or whether they see it as an incredibly powerful tool for projecting Russian power into the world? Well, I think there is this um, undeniable... A relationship between Putin and certainly, um, as you say, the Siloviki and his advisors with the Russian Orthodox Church. And they take it very seriously. And I've never quite understood it politically why the Russian Orthodox Church would support someone like Putin in terms of his obviously repression and why Putin uh, feels that uh, the Russian Orthodox Church is so important for his political identity. Um, and I suppose as he may think that if he can, he can secure the support of the Orthodox Church, it gives him a certain uh, moral um, entitlement or um, justification. And so um, what's, I think, what more curious, and I haven't studied this in depth, is why the Orthodox Church, you know, uh, obviously a Christian uh, entity why they would support an agency which by any definition um the fsb and putin have done horrific uh, acts against human beings and but there is this definite relationship and um i've kind of came across a quote in august 2001 where father alexander who's the church of the church of the holy wisdom in the orthodox church he actually said quote thank god there is the fsb all power is from God, and so is theirs. And so, unless there's a corrupt relationship, perhaps, and I haven't studied this in depth, between um, the Kremlin and the Orthodox Church, and that they fund the Orthodox Church, perhaps, but I don't know if that's true, it's my speculation. Um, or you could argue that there is this uh, innate conservatism within churches in the same way that perhaps this may not be a fair comparison, the way that the Catholic Church um, uh, were reluctant to uh, criticise the Nazis during the Second World War, or the Catholic Church when there was these horrific child abuse allegations and they they, they covered it all up, uh, covered up crime. So, again, this is not really my area of expertise, mm -hmm. but I think there must be, I think, an innate conservatism within these established churches whereby they basically will support the status quo in the established state. Um, but there is a, a real contradiction there between, you know, their Christian values and Christian principles of compassion and humanitarianism and, and, and support for the sick and anti-corruption, and at the same time supporting someone like Putin. I mean, I, I suspect, again, I, I haven't looked into it deeply, but I've spoken to people like Olga Lautman who have, I, I kind of suspect that it's far more pernicious than that. It's not the case of a uh, an organisation which otherwise would be independent, would otherwise be moral, would otherwise um, have some agency, but that's being repressed or you know, channeled um, for self-interest. I, I 
suspect that with you know Stalin's purges or even Peter the Great's attempts to smash the independence of of, of the church that it's simply another wing of the state it's another means to project power and one perhaps shouldn't even distinguish between um you know KGB officers and the patriarch they're they're the same thing in some ways but yeah I, I'm definitely going to do a future episode on that with people who have have researched that um I think it's an interesting part of that. But if we now turn to Ukraine, um, you say, uh, I think rightly, that uh, the sort of paranoia and the the history of the KGB, uh, FSB as it, as it morphed into, uh, is an important part of why the Ukraine war is happening. But also it's a tool that's used in that invasion itself, isn't it? They play a key role in... Uh, threatening the uh, mobilized troops and in um you know the torture cells that we've seen um in terms of also uh, fermenting the so-called uprising in the uh, DNR um you know uh, Donetsk people's republic Kranz people's republic for those who don't believe there's anything organic about those insurgencies against the Ukrainian government it suggests that the role of in this case the GRU is is incredibly important to what's been happening over the last nine years. Yes, I mean, uh, in my book, I interview um, the former head of the Ukrainian Security Service. Um, he was head of the uh, the SBU, um, the Ukrainian Intelligence Agency, on two occasions, and was there um, uh, ten years ago. Well, it was just after. Um, uh, when Russia invaded Crimea and, and uh, in 2014. And what he says is that um, the FSB uh, basically penetrated the Ukrainian political and security establishment, um, and they've been planning uh, this invasion for some time. And so they've been using all the old KGB uh, methods of, of hacking, of, of compromise, and um, promoting disinformation. But as you say, they've been an integral part of the military um, operation as well. And, you know, many US, sorry, FSB and KGB officers, they often uh, have been told to read Sun Tzu, who's the Chinese military historian, who said that all warfare, all warfare is deception. And so that link between the military and the intelligence has is, is, is been very important to them. But the, the FSB played a, a really integral role um, in the war as, as in itself. Um, but all the operations that they've been using in terms of disinf to disinformation, which is actually very important because if you want to secure the loyalty of your troops on the ground, and you also want to secure the loyalty of your of the people back home in Russia, and you also want to confuse um, the enemy. That's where disinformation deception is so important, and that's what they've been doing. Um, and so they're really using the same KGB playbook. The only difference is the technology, and that the technology at their disposal is quite frightening and um, uh, remarkable, and more pervasive and um, widespread and. And also because it's no longer anchored to a particular ideology, which puts some limits on the sort of disinformation and the object of that disinformation. Now we've seen, of course, and it may well be that they always did this and, and, and do correct me if that's the case. Um, but now they can support the far right. They can support the far left. They can support every single extreme oppositionist um, grouping they might find in in any given society, and that's not to say that those people's opinions, you know, are not important or that there aren't valid points being made across the political spectrum. But the Russian um, active measures tries to target anything that it thinks could weaken or drive a wedge in a society or destabilize it, um, and it's it's obviously a perversion. And a distortion of what would otherwise be a fairly organic uh, process that uh, that democracies require to function. Yes, I mean you're quite right. They have no moral or ideological uh, mission there. They're, they're, they're pure, they, their sole aim 
in Ukraine or anywhere in the West, really, is to foment um, chaos and tension and instability. And it doesn't matter if they are promoting a far right or far left or anarchic or liberal, um, uh, you know, to, to promote promote those forces if they think they can um, create a sense of chaos. And their main task is to um, promote division within those societies. So they might promote, you know, a far right and the far left at the same time. And certainly during the Cold War, um, they forged a lot of documents. When I did the, the research, when I did the research for my book, I was very quite surprised at the, the, the sheer volume of documents um, that the KGB forged and there wasn't enough space in the book so I, I for all of them so i put them in a in an appendix at the end of the book but you know there was no they didn't really care um which side they would support or oppose it was just creating chaos and and disruption to the regimes of the west and also that helps in their mind to um uh, create the impression that democracy is unstable that uh, democracy is a sort of frightening and often inefficient way of governing. And that narrative can then also, it's not just to destabilize opponents, it's also a narrative they can play back to their own people. And this is something we saw very visibly on show uh, during Maidan and the Orange Revolution. Now, these are processes which I think we would agree with, with most Ukrainians that have made Ukrainian society healthier, that have given the tools to start to tackle corruption, start to change and evolve their societies. And um, I was listening to, to Paul Mason last night, who traveled to Ukraine twice with a 10-year gap um, either side of that visit. And he said the changes were phenomenal, um, you know, the evolution and the progress in society. Not perfect, a lot, a long way to go but the evolution was absolutely tremendous. So we see these sort of changes, political upheavals as in aggregate being positive, but the way that is then sold back to the Russian people is that, uh, you know, this political evolutionary process, it's destabilizing, uh, you know, it's, it's corrupt, it'll destroy the economy, it blah, blah, blah. And actually that works incredibly well with, with most Russians, it seems. Yes, yeah, so I think you made an extremely good point because in terms of the Russian culture, uh, if you've met Russian people, I mean, they they really regard Western society as, as corrupt and decadent. And there's a certain puritanical uh, characteristic of, of Putin and his small advisors. They, you know, they regard particularly America as a very decadent, corrupt, immoral society uh, where you know, there's so much crime. And um, uh, so that is a very important part of their message. Um, and that's how they can, to some extent, justify um, not having a freedom of speech, freedom of association, freedom of the press. And and, and as you know, the, the, the problem is probably the majority of Russian people uh, agree with him in the sense that for them, the priority in life is food on the table, electricity and gas to to heat themselves family efficiency security and so elections democracies um the freedom of speech freedom you know pe freedom of people to uh, publish or oppose are uh, basically a luxury and 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 but also they i think they argue that it's a kind of source of of chaos and they point to the political systems particularly in places like Israel or Italy um, where you have, uh, or Ireland even, where you have multiple elections, and they'll say, "Well, look at you know, you 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 believe in democracy. Look at look at these countries uh, where there is so-called democracy, and there's just and you know chaos with coalition governments, and you've got regimes where the left and the right are cooperating, um, and they regard it as as a sort of sign of weakness. And then obviously in America, they'll point to January the sixth. And what happened there? So for Russian people, they can somehow justify the lack of democracy in Russia by pointing at the West and saying, "Well, look, this is what happens when you have democracy." And it's incredibly effective, isn't it? Because uh, it does seem to trickle down to people, um, even when the neighbouring country, Ukraine, um, is quite clearly making you know significant social political progress from those changes that 
partly helps to explain as well why the Russian approach to Ukraine is not just hostility, but it also has a really kind of unpleasant, prejudicial, sort of almost genocidal uh, edge to it. Um, and Putin, I think, realized that he had to completely ostracize uh, Russian people from Ukraine so that they don't look in that direction, so that they... Uh, Anything that comes from Ukraine in their minds is tainted uh, and they don't learn any of the lessons uh, that uh, that seem to be coming out of Ukraine in how you actually move from Homo Sovieticus and how you actually rip out that sort of mindset and try and replace it with something uh, more healthy and evolutionary. Yes, I think it's incredibly selective how Putin uh, and his propaganda machine have portrayed Ukraine. Um, and you know the, the 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 cost of what they would call economic security in Russia is, is absolutely huge, because as you know, um, and from my last book, London Grad, the actual wealth of, of 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 Russia has basically been stolen by a small number of oligarchs and people uh, close to the Kremlin and the Siloviki. Um, and so the argument that you need to have um, a strong state. And a secure state, um, uh, and, and, and a strong nationalistic authoritarian state, and that will that will make a better life. It doesn't stack up. Is it? It doesn't just doesn't stack up because the wealth of Russia has, you know, the vast wealth of Russia has, has is concentrated in a very few hands. In the same way that it was in America when you had the robber barons in the early twentieth century or late nineteenth century. So that. Um, promise that they make, uh, the vast majority of Russians are not benefiting from that ideology. And so uh, I think that's where it all falls apart. And then there's the physical cost itself of that security infrastructure. So you have the sort of the, the, the Sylvia Key class, but more particularly the KGB, which we're talking about. Um, you mentioned these figures that, that typically through the last decades in the Cold War, it was better staffed. They had more people, not necessarily more efficient, but they had a lot more uh, resource. Um, and the overall cost of maintaining the security infrastructure over decades must be absolutely vast. Do we have any sense of, of what the material cost of this system is? Well, we don't have precise figures or budgets of what the KGB uh, was spending, but we do know um, that it was in the hundreds of millions, which in the 1970s and 80s is a huge amount of money. And that their budget was certainly in the hundreds of millions, some people argue billions. Um, the CIA and MI6 certainly did a certain amount of research uh, into that, into this, but they certainly, it was certainly true and demonstrably true that they had more agents and KGB officers, certainly in the United States. Uh, and and actually in the in the UK in the late 1960s there were far more KGB officers on the streets of London than there were MI5 officers and they were overrunning British intelligence in the late 60s or throughout the 1960s to such an extent it got so bad that in 1971 um, the Conservative government under Edward Heath made this historic decision to expel 105 KGB spies from London. Because they were basically over, almost overrunning the city, abusing their diplomatic privileges, and so certainly I would say in the fifties, sixties, and seventies, uh, the KGB, uh, you know, almost had the upper hand, certainly in, in resources, um, and uh, that obviously leads you to the the issue of well, all this money, what was it being used for? It was used being used for intelligence operations. Obviously, it should have been used. To improve the the lives of ordinary Russian people, so um, and then you have the issue of all, what happened to all these KGB secret accounts, and I think even to this day they've never necessarily been discovered. And so I think it's a very it's a it's a an area um, that, that that is still uh, secret even today. And you know they basically thought that it was more important to overthrow the West. In terms of the amount of money and 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 manpower they were using, rather than to feed their own people, and so that only really changed in in the eighties when um, the Russian the Soviet economy started to uh, fall apart. Mm. 
And the scale of this penetration of the West is huge. And of course, it follows on from the 1930s and 40s, the Cambridge spy ring and the sort of really deep penetration of, of British uh, security establishment. Do we have a sense of what all of these people were doing, the kind of operations they were engaged in? You talked about honey traps, trying to compromise diplomats and so on. I'm sure, you know, not everything has come to light, but do we know enough to sort of understand what some of those operations looked like and against whom they were targeted? Well, the KGB were trying, were, their strategy was twofold. Number one was to try and find, uh, certainly in the UK, government secrets, so documents, any any secret got, uh, British government documents, particularly to do with defence or security, and to uh, obtain those documents, which is largely by uh, recruiting agents. And uh, as you say, in the 1930s, they recruited Philbis, Philby, Burgess, McLean, and Cairn Cross. Um, they had less success after the Second World War, but they did have agents. So that was a... I and mean, then they would try and recruit MPs. And to some extent, they were successful. Certainly some Labour MPs were arguably agents of influence, doesn't necessarily mean they were spies, but they were trying to be. They were certainly helpful to the KGB. But they were quite active in London, um, really throughout the Cold War, trying to recruit, for example, secretaries to MPs who were prominent in in the House of Commons or foreign policy. Uh, they would focus on um, junior officials to try and get secrets and documents. So that was uh, certainly a priority for the KGB in the UK. Secondly, was to basically smear, denigrate, destroy the lives of any critics, particularly MPs. And there's a whole chapter in my book uh, about a Conservative MP um, called um, Anthony Courtney, who was an MP uh, who was very anti-Soviet, uh, anti-communist, and uh, he was very vocal about um, attacking uh, the KGB officers' activities in London in the 1950s and 60s. and But he also, while he was an MP, also had a consultancy business going to Russia. And uh, he had a, like a, he advised Western companies to how they were going to do business in Russia. And even though he was quite right-wing, hated communism, hated the Soviet Union, but was pro-Russia, and he spoke Russian. And so, but he was very vocal and public about attacking um, the Soviet Union. So they, but he also, his weakness was women. And so when he went to Moscow, he would have flings and affairs with Russian women. He was obviously married. And eventually they got, the KGB decided to go for him. So they honey trapped him with a, a young lady who worked for in tourist agency, which is um, a tourist agency based in Moscow, which had helps and advises foreign visitors with cars and travel and, and 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 you know how to get about around Moscow, but it was completely penetrated by the KGB. So this MP, run by the KGB, Courtney, in fact, my my <laughs> uh, wife worked for a while in the nineties for it, and all of the mm. senior staff weren't just informers; they were they were actual you know low level agents. Right, exactly. I mean, it was it was a basically a KGB front. And so this MP um, was seduced by this young lady who worked as an employee of Intourist and a uh, classic honey trap. They took the photographs, had the documents, and then they, the KGB filed them away and waited for the right moment politically to then release this material. So they put it in a file and sent the photographs and a sort of broadsheet um, to uh MPs, the Prime Minister was then Harold Wilson at the time, this is the mid-1960s, um, and to his political opponents, uh, News the World, you know, any anyone who could make use of it. And it's a long detailed story, which is a, which is a whole chapter in the book. But eventually what happened was um the KGB succeeded. He had a safe seat in Harrow in North London. Um uh he stood but um, he lost the seat and he lost his marriage. And it was a very classic example of how the KGB operated um, against a political opponent. And this is one of the things they did. 
And then in the 70s and, and actually the 80s, the tide started to turn a little bit, didn't it? And there were some notable victories against the KGB. Um, uh, not necessarily you know, any operation that we'd run, but it was people becoming disenchanted with the with the system there. And we had Mitrochin, who was uh, extricated with a vast archive of KGB documents, which were invaluable to try and understand the inner workings of the organization. And then people like Gordievsky, quite sort of senior agents, who were able to give us a lot of understanding about the inner sort of workings and even the politics and rivalries that uh, went on inside there. Um, I'd, I'd love to hear your sort of views on on some of the victories on our side and our attempts to understand how the Russian secret state functions. So by the early early 1980s, um, there was more and more disillusionment GB. Um, they would not have any real success. They weren't recruiting new agents in the West. They didn't seem to be making any progress. And so um, there were more defections. And as you mentioned, um, Mitrokin, who was a KGB archivist, and he defected and took with him thousands and thousands of documents. He didn't actually take with him actual documents, but he every night he wrote down notes summarizing all these documents or transcribing them, basically. It was a huge archive which really revealed what the KGB had up, been up to. And then in the mid-'80s, uh, KG, a very senior KGB officer called Oleg, Oleg Gordievsky defected to the UK and he brought with him a whole real insight into um, KGB operations. It was a very damaging uh, series of defections. And what it showed was that by the early 1980s, um, the preconceived conspiracy theories of the Soviet Union and the KGB against the West was just not holding up in the fact that the, the the prediction of the inevitability of the demise of Soviet Union was going to was going to happen it never happened and then they had in the early 80s they had this conspiracy theory called operation ryan which was an active measure which they they basically believed that the US and the UK were going to launch nuclear war in the early 1980s they were going to destroy the world they were going to launch nuclear weapons against um, the Soviet Union and, and destroy the um, uh, its people. Ooh. Excuse me. Um, and um, but it was it was a classic situation of a preconceived conspiracy theory uh, that, that, that Andropov, um, uh, who was then head of the KGB, basically, and his colleagues uh, believed this was going to happen. And then they told their KGB officers to go out and find the evidence rather than finding out what's really happening, what's really going on, and then make a conclusion. And so they they launched this very expensive um, uh, active measure, destabilization, called Operation Ryan, was basically to go out into the West and promote this conspiracy theory that the West, the Thatcher was a war, Thatcher and Reagan were warmongers. They wanted to end the world start World War Three, So they would fake documents um, to try and propagate this message. Um, they even um, fabricated a, a telephone conversation between Thatcher and Reagan. And what they did was that they, they recorded or obtained public broadcasts and interviews by Thatcher and Reagan. And then they edited and spliced it together um, to show to 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 make it look as though they were having a conversation about launching Armageddon, and so these are the sort of things they did, and the uh, documents were forged, and that was really the beginning of the end because by the mid '80s, obviously uh, nuclear war didn't happen, um, and um, Perestroika and Glasnost came in under Gorbachev, and Gorbachev realized a bit belatedly that these kinds of um, uh, active measures and uh, operations were, um, there's no point to them and they weren't having an impact and they were dishonest and they were counterproductive. So eventually he, he, um, he stopped uh, uh, these kind of operations. And Gorbachev himself, he didn't emerge from the security infrastructure, did he? He was more from the party background, I think. I may be wrong yes. there. 
Um, yes. Whereas Putin firmly has come from from that sort of more paranoid uh, other part of the Russian power center under the Soviet Union, and indeed, you know, some some other um, rulers did. Uh, it was Andropov. He was he came from that sort of KGB class, didn't he? Yes. Yeah, he did. Um, and Putin, you know, it's very important uh, to know his his approach, which is, you know, very paranoid um, and his mindset, you know, he spent his whole adult professional career um, in the KGB. So, um, and that's why he, in terms of the war, for example, he doesn't trust anyone. So either he doesn't trust anyone or he's so arrogant. So he's conducted the war with a small number of advisors. And he's also interfered militarily in a lot of the military decisions and operations in Ukraine, which has been a disaster because he's micromanaged the war and he may be realized that this is a big mistake, but he um, was himself instrumental in making military decisions in Ukraine, partly because of this sort of doesn't, you know, lack of trust of anyone, paranoia, conspiracy minded, um, that, that you, you know, you have to keep these decisions within a, an elite. And so uh, this is his big mistake. And if you compare Putin to Stalin, Stalin during the Second World War, although obviously he was a brutal dictator and very autocratic in every way like Putin, but Stalin ultimately listened to his generals. And that's why uh, in the Second World War, Stalin was much more successful, obviously with, with at huge cost, but with the siege of Star Stalingrad, Whereas that's the difference. And I think with Putin, you know, he really, I mean, he, one of his famous quotes that he thinks that spies can can have more of an impact than politicians. Intelligence operations are more important. And um, that's, that's his whole mindset. And that's really, uh, in some ways, the cause of the crisis in Ukraine at the moment is that um, Putin is thinking like an intelligence officer rather than overseeing a, a professional military operation and perhaps he's also thinking like a junior intelligence officer because by all accounts he wasn't that senior he wasn't a key strategic person within uh within the kgb he was a pretty low level and fairly mediocre operative i think that opinion has been expressed a number of times and i think the difference there isn't it that putin may understand that you can do something and so he does it, whereas someone more strategic will understand, well, you can do something, but should you? And it seems that Putin doesn't doesn't have that sort of check. Should we really be following everything to its logical conclusion? Um, and it's been said that he doesn't have a de-escalation uh, sort of mindset, that he will always try to escalate a situation, always push back uh, on the assumption that the enemy will be weaker than he is, and eventually they will not last the course and they will not use equivalent strength that he's prepared to do. Whereas perhaps someone more strategic and higher up in the secret services will say, well, OK, may maybe there should be a point at which we stop and change tack. I don't know if you had any thoughts there about, um, you know, you know his, his seniority or his mindset and how that might come from him not necessarily being the sort of, you know, the the best of the KGB. And I don't mean best in a moral sense. I mean, uh, you know, not not the brains of the outfit. Yes, I mean, you're, you're right in that um, Putin was a relatively junior KGB officer, middle ranking. Um, I don't think he spent that much time in the field in terms of operations or recruiting agents, office bound, very bureaucratic. Uh, role in throughout the 1980s as an intelligence officer. And I think what we're seeing, what's emerging now, is that actually he's rather an in insecure uh, little man who, um, like a lot of insecure people, uh, they feel the need to project themselves and be tough and, and authoritarian and, and dictatorial. And so, and at, at the same time, uh, micromanage everything. So it's a form, it's, it's a source of their basic insecurity, because they were never in charge of any, you know, he never was until he became head of the FSB in the late 90s. Um, you know, he never had uh, 
that responsibility or seniority or experience. So I think that's his problem, really, and that uh, that sense of insecurity is is, is why he's uh, gone into all the sort of minute details, as, as from what we understand, is that he gets involved in in in, in the kind of day to day uh, operations of the Ukraine war, which is ridiculous. Because one, he doesn't have the military experience, and two, it's it 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 uh, confuses his own military generals, and and it just it, it impedes their their operations. I mean, you've got this ex KGB officer and politician trying to um, run, a, you know, a risky, dangerous war, and I think it stems from I think it stems from his own insecurities and, and, and lack of experience. And talking about Mitrokhin and these other sort of leaks in the in the eighties and the nineties. Um, and there's there's some other extraordinary ones who went on to write books and do lectures who talked about the mechanics of active measures. And I'll, I'll put some links into the video. We know a certain amount about how the KGB was run uh, up until the early 2000s. Do we know that much about how the FSB is structured and run? Do we know anything about its methodologies, its training, the culture within that clique? Uh, and the sort of aspirations, if any, it might have. What what do we know? And what do we not know about the FSB? Well, we know that the FSB, I think we know a lot less. I mean, there have actually been relatively few defections from the FSB. I think there was, uh, during the war recently, there was one, I think, uh, in former Russian intelligence officer who has defected. But there hasn't been, as far as I can tell, and it's not really my area of expertise, there's a very good book, uh, called the New Nobility, which is a more up-to-date uh, book about uh, the FSB, um, and that I, my my understanding is the FSB is is become much more of a uh, tool. I mean, a, a, an agency of repression of almost going back to the old days, even before the Cold War, of like a private army for Putin, um, and a, a, an agency of repression. Obviously, they've kept up. Um, all the old uh, operations of disinformation to, during 2016, clearly um, there was a huge effort to disrupt the US election um, using hacking and fake social media accounts. And they had this um, agency called the Internet Research Agency, I think it was called. Mm. Um, so I think there, there's, a, there's, there's actually, in terms of discipline, the FSB have been quite effective in in not having defectors um and uh i think what the the disclosures have been more about the gru when you look at the skripal uh attempted assassination you know that was a gru operation not fsb and with litvinenko well I'm, maybe i'm sure fsb were involved but again that seemed to be done by freelancers so um i think there's a huge amount that we don't know about the fsb um and so I think that's the one positive thing they could claim that they've not had, as far as I know, and I'm, it's not really my area of expertise. I can't think, and maybe I'm, I can be mistaken. There hasn't been, you know, the equivalent of Mitrokhin or Gordievsky uh, within the FSB who's gone to the West. I mean, maybe they have, um, and so I think that that could be, well, maybe the next book. I think that that's an interesting point. I'll put a link to that because I think it's Andres Soldatov and Irina Baragan who who wrote the um, New Nobility. And Andres has been on the channel, uh, but we were we were sort of we only touched on the the sort of GRU uh, in part of that. It'd be great to get him back on to talk about that in more detail. And yes, one would have thought, one would have hoped there'd be more defections there. I mean, it has to be said, there's only been one senior diplomat um, has defected, um, Boris Bandarev. Uh, also on the channel, um, and uh, only one of Putin's private guard, who apparently came um, left the country last year, but has broken cover this year to talk a bit about that, um, you know, what he saw. And he was someone who set up the sort of private secure communications networks uh, wherever Putin went in different locations. But there's very, very few people uh, at that kind of senior level have left and and talked about it. 
And that leads me on to the last question here, really, which is we haven't seen anyone really significant break ranks. We don't have a really clear idea of how the FSB works. We know that it's incredibly powerful and that it penetrates business, society, show business. It's got its claws into into everything. It knows what's going going on um, and jumps on any kind of dissent the, the minute it happens, it seems. How... How is this organization to be rooted out of the society? You know, what would need to happen and what political will would need to be there to, you know, uproot this this absolutely terrifying monster uh, from within Russian society? I know it's a fanciful question, but I think it's worth thinking about. Well, obviously, for the FSB to be disbanded, uh, Putin would have to be dethroned. It'd have to be a revolution or a coup. Um, they would have to lose lose the war. Um, but the truth is, in my view, even if the FSB was abolished, there would be a new version of it because um, regardless of all their crimes and horrific actions, every country needs a security service. So it's really a question, Not it's not whether they should be abolished, it's a question of how they operate and how they act. And, or, and under whose orders and the lack of accountability. So I think that, you know, we are, the West is suffering from a lack of knowledge. Of how they, uh, But I think it seems to me that the CIA and MI6 had a reasonably good uh, resources within either the Kremlin. I think they accurately predicted the war would happen before it happened. And so I think the the level, the quality of intelligence gathering by the West in Russia is relatively good. Um, and so, uh, but I think in terms of the FSB being disbanded, that will have to be a political decision. They're not going to go away. And to be fair to them, they're clearly a very professional, um, very disciplined. I'm sure they've been financially well rewarded uh, organization. And that's the one efficient thing that Putin has done is to keep them loyal. And either they, the FSB officers are either loyal because they believe in the organization have been brainwashed or they're too scared to defect. And I think it's a, probably a combination of both. Or utterly cynical. And uh, and, and it's in, you know, their self-interest to, to keep that uh, clique or club going. Um, well, I mean, probably, I think we... but, you know... Gordievsky defected, you know, he took huge risks, Gordievsky, when he defected in 1985. And so he had obviously was very strongly motivated. Mm. And I think, I suspect that FSB officers today, um, they clearly, they believe in the system. You know, they believe in uh, a rigid authoritarian, effectively dictatorship. Um, and they, it's like a cult almost. And so they've been brainwashed or they, this is what they believe. And so that's why I don't think you've got that same ideological, uh, division or, um, debate that we had during the cold war, because economically, even Putin believes that you have to capitalism is, is the only free markets are the only realistic way of doing business. Um, even though, uh, in reality, much of the um, state uh, oil, oil and gas resources and energy resources are controlled by the state. They still operate in the marketplace. They still operate as capitalists. So you you don't have that same ideological debate that you had during the Cold War. Now it seems to be much more about power rather than how society should be run. And that's possibly, probably, why there's not been any as far as we know, defections from the FSB. And that's a really interesting place to end, Mark, with that thought. I think that's a very sort of profound way to, to summarise that. And it puts a certain note of realism there that we should not expect necessarily a sort of coup uh, from from the top or from the Siliviki class. Um, well, thank you so much for your time. I highly recommend people read your book. We'll pop a link into that. And of course, the previous London grad, which we discussed into the description of this video. And um, yeah, good luck in, in, in any events you're doing around the book. And uh, I hope it does extremely well. Thank you very much, Jonathan. Thank you.